shift me uh, proclamation. Okay, that's right. Not, not right now. I'm not sure if I have a note for myself or what pants. I'm not sure. From last time, I'm not sure. <laughs> Random doodlings of myself. I can't figure that one out. I can't either. Yes, yeah, so that's me. That's well, maybe me. somebody else. <laughs> no, that's me. I have pants. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if I either. Tear it off. Not sure if I either. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We could try to. Oh, I was there. We all would like to see it. Would be great. Congratulations. We we had a very good time. The only. Okay, Mr. Mayor. How you doing? Well. I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarver Springs on Tuesday, December 16, 2014 at 632. Roll call. Mayor Archie. Here. Vice Mayor Larson. Here. Commissioner Terrapani. Here. Commissioner Banther. Here. Commissioner Sieber. Here. Uh, tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Jack Long and uh, from uh, Bayonet Point Hospital. Will everyone Stand, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance following. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed time of the year. We rejoice to be your servants here. We ask that you would bless this group that is gathered for the benefit of Tarpon Springs and its environs. We thank you for each one and their families. We pray for all those who participate tonight, that you would encourage them and bless them as they seek what's best for this community. Lord, we thank you for the joy that comes at this time of the year, but we know there are many who are experiencing grief and sorrow. Would we be sensitive and care for them? Lord, we know that this is a time of peace, and as we look around our world, we don't see much. But Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to our hearts and touch our lives, that we might share it with others. Bless us this evening. Would your name be exalted? And we rejoice in that name. Amen. <clears throat> We will now go to public comments on any item that will not be discussed this evening. Seeing none, we go to uh, proclamations and the uh, item number one is a uh, proclamation for Tarpon Springs High School Band. And uh, this proclamation reads, City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, be it remembered that the city of Tarpon Springs and the citizens recognize and commend the Tarpon Springs High School Outdoor Performance Ensemble for an claiming another major championship, the Band of America Championship. And be it remembered that the band took first place in the three-day Band of America National Championship held at Lucas Oil Stadium in Annapolis from November 12th through November 15th. 2014, and be it remembered that the band came out on top of dozens of schools at the Band of America Championship, scoring 97.15 uh, with its show, Man vs. Machine, and also received awards for Outstanding Music Performance and Outstanding General Effect. And be it remembered that the band is the most accomplished marching band in the state of Florida, crowned the 2000, 2001, 2003, 2005, 2006 division, uh, AA Bands of America, and be it remembered that the city of Tarpon Springs is honored to have an exceptional program where students experience a sense of community. In addition, the per, uh, perseverance and vision for this outstanding program creates a place where students learn values, responsibility, fair share, and a common goal. Now, therefore, in consideration, I, David or Archie, by virtue of authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, do hereby recognize and honor the Tarpon Springs High School Outdoor Performance Ensemble and Director Kevin Ford for their outstanding accomplishments. Not sure if Mr. Ford, Mr. Joyer, the principal of Tarpon High is here, and some of the students that come forward. I just mentioned in front of us is the trophy that was awarded to them. 
I'm not sure if y'all have anything to say. Oh, I know. <laughs> Take this opportunity. You know. Somebody has to know. say something. So to get an amazing opportunity like this for a band that we have is a huge thank to our community because we wouldn't have been able to build as far as we got or as been as successful as we are without the support of many parents who came through the program, many grandparents and great-grandparents that came through the program that supported us all the way. So right now I'd like to stop and give a big thank you to all the community members that have ever helped us, Mayor Archie and all the commissioners, because without their help we wouldn't have gone as far as we did. So thank you. I'd just like to uh, mention, I know that uh, my colleagues probably want to have something to say, and maybe some of the people in the audience would like to, is that, you know, it seems like we are continually giving the high school band a proclamation or a Mr. Ford, a key to the city or something, but they do so much to, uh, to recognize Tarpon Springs as, to me, the number one band in the entire nation, I say the world, but you know, some people might have a, feel like I'm a little biased, but you know, um, looking at the documentary on the journey to uh, Macy's uh, Day Parade kind of put some things in perspective, you know, and I know Mr. Ford would agree is that, you know, he's out front, he is the leader, but there are so many other people that give up their time, energies, and effort, as well as the students, uh, their parents, the boosters, on and on that make these things happen. And they uh, epitomize to me um, what leadership is and what Tarpon Spring High School is. And you know, I tell them is that I'm not a former sponger because once a sponger, always a sponger. So, <laughs> You know, there's that spongy pride that we all have that have graduated from the high school. And the band is always doing some things to let people across the country know that uh, Tarpon Springs is alive and well, and we have some of the best young people uh, anywhere. So I just want to say personally, you know, I thank all of you. Uh, for, I know this is just a small portion of the band, but we thank you for coming out. But also, we thank everybody that uh, participates with the band. You know, there's a lot of things that's happening behind the scenes in terms of helping to support these students and this band go on and do bigger and better things. So uh, I'm hoping that this won't be the last proclamation that I'm able to give. I know it's not going to be the last proclamation that uh, the band earned. So I just want to say thank you for all that you do and how you represent Tarpon so well. And like I say, I know that my colleagues uh, will have something to say. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Lawson. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I, I really just want to congratulate uh, our Tarpon Springs High School Outdoor Performance Ensemble. Um, we, we get uh, recognition not just in Tarpon Springs, not just in Pinellas County, not just in the state of Florida, but across the United States, and I think that's exciting. Um, it, it really is impressive, and I want to congratulate the members of the band as well as the, the teachers, the directors, the principal, but also the, the parents that are involved because I know that's a key component as well, and there's a lot of sacrifices made by the parents, and I, I want to congratulate them as well. It, it really is exciting, and as, as a city commissioner, as the vice mayor, I am really proud of the contributions made uh, by our Tarpon Springs High School Band. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to say, I mean, it, 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 it was an honor even one one year ago to, 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 to go to, go to, uh, go to uh, New, New, New York and see you all mar march in the parade and see that Tarpon Springs sign come, come down whatever cold street that that uh, that that uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, was and you all are, are true ambassadors of our city wherever you go and you do more to promote this town than I think you all you all you all uh, you all realize so I, I, I thank you for for your for all, all, all of your efforts and your hard work because um, I, th I think it is paying off thank you uh, thank you yeah I also want to 
echo the comments and the uh, appreciation that I have for every time we continuously uh, recognize the band and all of your achievements. It's certainly a joy to be able to do so on such a regular basis. Um, you are without a doubt a shining star um, within this community. I think everybody recognizes that and uh, keep up the good work. But thank you very much. I just also want to say congratulations. Of course, it's all been said. Uh, I didn't go to Tarpon High, but I'm a former guidance counselor from Tarpon High, so I feel like I'm a sponger. I'm also a Tarpon High parent. Um, I really love what you guys do every year. And uh, I was talking to Mr. Ford about uh, the citizens getting to see your performance, if we can somehow put it online. Or I know your, your time is very valuable, and you don't have probably time to do the performance. Uh, for the city maybe with other competitions coming up but um, if you all can think of a way to put it online for uh, everyone in Tarpon Springs to get to appreciate it and see it that would be wonderful and thank you for all you do any uh, public comments on this item yes sir to forward you, go to the forward the state's name address for the record there I had the pleasure of working at Tarpon High for well, about 38 years, and uh, since the day Mr. Ford came on the campus, it's been different, and it's growing and growing, and I know that uh, the first question I asked him is, what's next? Hopefully we'll get a great answer for that. I'm sure we will, but thank you for a job well done. Nita Pros, 901 Bay Shore Drive. Mr. Ford, I love it when y'all practice because I sit on my back porch in my University of Florida rocking chair, and I have a grand concert of music every night when you practice. So keep up the practice because it's better than watching TV, and it is really nice to be able to hear the band. Uh, it carries all the way over to Bay Shore and further, and I congratulate you because being an alumni of Tarpon High, when I went to Tarpon High, our band was very small. <laughs> That's aging me. But you've come a long way, and I really enjoy the music. Thank you. Any other public comments in the item? If not, we thank you again for all you do for uh, the citizens of Tarpon Spring. Uh, next we have on our agenda is uh, Feast Day of Epiphany. We have a proclamation. <coughs> this proclamation reads, City of Tarpon Spring, Florida, whereas His Eminence Archbishop uh, Demetrius of America and His Eminence Metropolitan Alexius of Atlanta will be celebrating the Feast Day of Epiphany, and where the City of Tarpon Spring is identified by history and tradition as the city in the United States with the longest consecutive celebration of the feast day of epiphany and the home of the oldest and largest celebration in the united states and whereas the city of tarver spring has been internationally known and officially designated as epiphany city and whereas the city of tarver spring is home to saint nicholas greek orthodox cathedral patron saint to sponges shrimping and fishing seamen and whereas the feast day of epiphany is steadfast and true to the belief and customs rich in tradition and cultural orthodox Christian faith and whereas his eminence Archbishop Demetrius and his eminence Metropolitan Alexis have bestowed special honor on the city of Tarver Springs and the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral for their participation on this special occasion of the Feast Day of Epiphany. Now therefore I, David Archie, by virtue of authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarver Springs do hereby proclaim January 6, 2015, as Feast Day of Epiphany. Mr. Gombos. First of all, everyone's welcome to come. Uh, I want to thank the city for all that you do to make our city look beautiful and the assistance you give us uh, at every angle, whether it's law enforcement or uh, the city in general. Uh, I've been involved with Epiphany for about 40 years and uh, there's not once that I've asked for anything and didn't get it. So uh, thank you. 
thank you and for all you do for the church and for the city. Uh, next we have presentation, Bank of America procurement card presentation. Uh, good evening, Jay Jackis, uh, Chief Procurement Officer. Typically, procurement likes to stay in the background uh, when at all possible. If we, uh, if we are noticed, it's usually because someone's got a bid protest or there's an issue somewhere. Uh, but tonight, that's not the case. Uh, the purpose of the presentation is twofold. Uh, number one is to provide you with an update of our purchasing card or P-card program and provide a history of our annual rebates. As you can see, since 2005, uh, we've maintained a steady increase in the amount of our rebate, our annual rebate. Uh, if you notice on uh, the, the listing here, 2006 has a misprint that actually should be $4,513.41. In 2010, our rebate rose to $8,578.80. That was the year the board authorized us to utilize the Hillsborough County uh, purchasing card program. Uh, the program increased our our uh, annual multiplier, and that was the uh, the case of us uh, the higher rebate. And the $8,000 only reflects six months at that higher multiplier. Next slide again. There's a, a, a misprint that should read 2011. Uh, that year we earned $23,569.75. Uh, that was the first year at the higher multiplier. Uh, we began, began making credit card payments against some of our larger contracts, which were competitively bid, so there was no increase in our price uh, because of the higher fees charged to the uh, contractors. Uh, we used the disposal of yard waste, uh, about $24,000 a month, and the golf course maintenance contract, uh, which was $44,000 a month. And again, the bid prices were established prior to us uh, making those P-card uh, purchases. <coughs> In 2014, we went up to 49,197.02. Uh, ePayables program was established in April of that year. ePayables is a credit card based program. Uh, unique credit card number is issued to the vendor. Once an invoice is submitted and approved for payment, funds are added to the credit card. It's similar to the uh, reloadable credit cards that you get as rebates for you know, telephones and that sort of thing. And once the phones, funds have been taken, the card uh, balance remains at zero dollars until another payment is authorized. Um, with the RO plant, we started using P-card payments for um, owner direct purchases. Uh, none of the suppliers agreed to take the e-payables. That's helped us uh, increase our rebate dramatically. Uh, the next steps, uh, we continue to expand the payables program, uh, expand the use of the P-card payments for those not accepting e-payables and include the option to accept e-payables in all of our bid documents. Uh, in our RFP process, we're also offering a five-point bonus for anybody who takes e-payables. So with the RFPs, well, we already have a five-point bonus for any locals, and any locals that will take a P-card payment will get 10 extra uh, bonus points. Um, and in closing, I would like to ask uh, Kathy Morgan and Rhonda Simmons, that's the CM and RS that you see in our bid uh, bid numbers uh, to present you with the check for this year's rebate in the amount of $49,197.02. Quite an increase from uh, 2005 when we only got $4,000. Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to be getting some money back, so we definitely thank you and rest of staff for this program. Any uh, public comments on this item? Uh, the next item that we have is All-American City Quilt uh, Tour. Uh, Ms. Lemons and team. Thank you very much. We are here to present to you the All-America City Quilt. It's here on its worldwide tour, countrywide tour. Um, with me are members of the team that went to Denver and helped to prepare the All-America City application, um, which, as you know, we presented the skit 
back in July to you. Um, just to give you a little brief background, um, each of the finalists was asked to present uh, a square for the quilt. Um, and as being one of the finalists, we put a, a, a square together. It's on the far right side, one, two, three, four squares down from the top. It's a, a rectangle. It's one of Christopher Still's um, paintings. That's the one that we thought best typified uh, Tarpon Springs. Um, it was about a year ago when we started the All-America City competition. I want to give some credit to Bob Wilson, who was a Rotarian and came up with the idea that because Tarpon Springs is already an All-America City, that we should be formally identified as such. And we put together an application to the National Civic League's All-America City competition. Uh, the National City Civic League promotes civic engagement, provides information on government practices, but it's most well known for the All-America City competition where each year they recognize 10 cities from across the country um, for their outstanding community and civic-based accomplishments. Um, with the backing of the Tarpon Springs Rotary Club, um, a group of Rotarian city and community leaders got together um, starting about a year ago and began putting together a 27-page application that described all the accomplishments that the city has done over the years. We included uh, redevelopment, how we engage youth, and our health and wellness, focusing on uh, the the growth and evolution of Florida Hospital North Pinellas, uh, Peace for Tarpon, the High School Leadership Conservatory, the Culinary Arts and Vet Academies, Cops and Kids, the Kaboom Project, um, our livable, walkable cities, our special area plan, our new business attraction, and our smart code, um, and the Girl Scouts creating a, a Tarpon Springs patch. We put all of that together in 27 pages, submitted it, and found out two months later in April that we were one of, 10, one of 20 finalists from throughout the country, which in and of itself was a tremendous accomplishment. What we found when we went to Denver in June was that many cities have applied over and over again and never got to that finalist stage. So we were very happy with that in our first ever application. So being a finalist meant that we traveled to Denver for the All-America City competition in June. Uh, we had to stage a 10-minute presentation before a juried group of national and regional government leaders. Uh, we had two months to prepare for that, and an additional challenge was they did not allow any PowerPoints or any kind of technological gadgets. So we had to do it the old-fashioned way by coming up with props and putting together our own, our own words and, and handheld um, props. Um, we got a, a standing ovation when we presented this in Denver. And um, as a finalist, we are now part of a network of cities throughout the country that we have the opportunity to share what we're doing and learn from those other outstanding cities what is working um, with them. So the quilt, again, was one of the several activities that we participated in. Uh, the photograph that we uh, chose from Christopher Still, we thought best exemplified um, what Tarpon Springs is all about. I cannot express enough words uh, of pride and accomplishment for the team that put this together for us. Um, we did it quickly, we did it efficiently, and without these people, we would never have been able to um, get to that finalist stage. So with me tonight are uh, Mayor Archie, who was um, one of our participants and traveled to Denver with us, Jean Coleman, who's a Rotarian, and her husband Jerry, who um, Jean really put everything together and was our, our leader throughout the entire competition. Uh, Sue Thomas, who was chamber president and Rotarian president at the time. Deb Connolly, Karen Owensby from Florida Hospital North Pinellas. Manuel Gambo, who I know was here, but he must have left. Um, Robin Sanger, Peggy Prostis, board member of the Historical Society. Kay Parmenter and her daughter, Lindsay, represented the Girl Scouts. Ron Haddad, uh, Roger Salou, Chris Alahusos, Kathy Monahan, uh, Jim McNeely. He's a professional stage manager, and without him, we would not have been able to put the props together. He did a tremendous job um, putting pictures together, getting them up, and um, helping us out. Uh, Jose Urgulis, who is our home homeless outreach officer, traveled with us. And then finally, again, Bob Wilson, who had the idea and helped us follow through with that. So again, I'm really proud of our city team and all that we have accomplished. And uh, it's a designation that we'll always be able to use um, to help promote um, another aspect of the city of Tarpon Springs. 
Um, following tonight, the quilt is going to be moved to the Historical Society, the train depot, where it will be um, hanging there for the rest of the week. And then we'll be shipping it off to the next All-America City, which is Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So again, thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for your support of our endeavor and our trip. And um, it's a yearly competition, so we may be coming back to you again for another, another chance at it. Thank you. Well, I just say uh, thank you, Karen, and everybody that was on that uh, team. It was uh, a, a lot of fun and a lot of work, but uh, it's something that I think is continuing to pay off for the city of Tarpon Springs as others around this country uh, find out about uh, the delightful <coughs> community that we have here. So uh, thank you, and uh, maybe we'll be doing it again. Uh, you will be. <laughs> Any public comments on this item? Uh, if not, then we will go to our next item, which is consent. Uh, minutes, November 18th and December 2nd, regular session. Attorney fees, trash mats, uh, Dano LLP invoice number 47490, Zenzao Law invoice 13796. Select uh, Williamson, Dakar, uh, Associates Incorporated for RFQ number 140100-S-JJ Performing Arts Center Renovations. Authorized the purchase of two uh, dry, dry prime diesel pumps through a Florida Sheriff's Association contract number 14-120904. Extend file number 130031-C-TK. 130031 Purchase of Dell Computing Equipment through Florida State Contract Number 250-WSCA-10-ACS. Increased file number 140089-C-JJ Lighten Sponge Docks to U.S. Communities Purchasing Alliance Master Agreement Number uh, ma IS-123023 and 11 is extend file number 100020-P-TK sludge hauling. Are there any items anyone would like to pull? The chair would entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Any uh, public comments on any of these items? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banton? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, next is special consent agenda item number 12, employee dental insurance renewal. Sniffing. Honorable Mayor and Commissioners, good evening. Jane Niffin, HR Director. I'm here tonight to ask that the city of Tarpon Springs renews its dental insurance with the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust, FMIT, using a United Healthcare platform for a period of 12 months, commencing January 1, 2015. I don't want to belabor anything that's already in the backup, but um, we started with the Florida League of Cities in 2012, which offered a better program at a more competitive price. Prior, prior to that, over the last 14 years, we have moved from plan to plan, issuing RFPs and getting, uh, getting decent deals, and then the second year being hit because of our claims experience and our utilization. So tonight I'm recommending that we renew with the Florida League of Cities. Um, the increase per, uh, per employee per month for the city would amount to $1.61. Um, and the, I would recommend that the, the city continue to pay that full share of uh, premium for the employees and that it maintain its current level um, of contribution to the dependents, which means that the dependent, the employees would pick up the increase for the dependent care. Any questions from Ms. Niffin? Chair will entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Any public comments on this item? <coughs> Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Bantha? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, item number 13, Retirement Consideration, M. Johnson. Jane, if you just stay, just in case we need it, I'll, I'll do it, but stay. Um, 
this is something I'm asking the commission to do. A, a city employee came to me probably several months ago for some consideration. Um, to not go into too much background since it's medical and we've got HIPAA laws and everything else, but he's got a medical situation. He's out there still trying to do his job and work hard, um, but his ability is, is, is declined to do that. He had come to me because he had remembered several years ago when we'd offered a retirement plan to the former employees and ask if anything or any version of that could be brought forward. Um, he's a 17 year old employee, very hard working, and even with the problems he is having, you still him, see him out there trying to do the job. I'm afraid if we don't do this, he'll try to work as long as he can. Um, he's getting close to some, some uh, abilities to, to get some other social security, um, which he'll do mid-year. So I went back and looked at what we did before, um, and what you see the, the, the uh, early retirement consideration is the exact thing we did before. I'm asking to do this for the medical considerations, which not only gives him a payment um, but also continues his health insurance, which will drop for us, I think, mid-year, because that's when, I think, the Social Security, I'm right, that's when that'll kick in, so that'll even drop off. But give him a year of co recovery and, and a plan. One of the things when I brought this forward to you before, obviously, if we have an employee at the top of the realm and we're going to hire somebody new, there'll be a cost savings. And we looked as one of the considerations from doing these the cost savings. And theoretically, you have a formula in there where we could recover the difference within a two year. But I always say two to three, because we talk about hiring somebody at 5% above starting. If there's a real good cement finisher out there, obviously we're going to pay them some more. So it may not be two years of projected, but in two or three years, the costs will make up for themselves. Um, it'll have paid for itself. And again, we'll, we'll be providing something for a hardworking 17-year employee who's, who's gone on some hard medical times. And, uh, and again, using that same for, formula, I think we can do it for this individual, recover the money in the two or three year period of time and, and help him in the system as he, he goes forward. So I, I would need your approval to do that under the plan you see existing. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward. For me, is that because we have done it before, and then uh, another opportunity to, to let employees know that we, we care about them and their <coughs> well-being um, as we move forward. Not only that, you know, there's cost saving, but just that we um, value each and every one of our employees, especially people that have been with us for a long period of time. I can be supportive of what you have uh, brought forward. You know, so. Um, uh, Vice Mayor. Mayor, I don't have any questions. I'd like to make a motion for approval. Second. Mr. Mayor, I have yes. a question. Um, first of all, I'd just say that I uh, wholeheartedly support this and, and uh, echo your comments, Mayor. I think it's always nice to see when an employee can go to the city manager and, and ask for something like this. Um, I like to see that, that open door uh, approach that Mr. LaCourse has. Um, just out of curiosity, is this the gentleman that we've been seeing um, working on the pavers? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm all good. Appreciate it. Uh, any public comments on this item? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Item number 14, <laughs> ratify appointment of finance director. Um, obviously, we'll see Ms. Walker at a commission meeting for the last time tonight when she presents her item on the budget. She has announced her retirement from the city after uh, a long service to the community and to the city. Um, being myself a second in command, not only at the police department and moving the chief, but in essence, uh, under Ms. Posvetch, a second in command, moving into the city manager's role, um, we always learn going up that you try to prepare somebody beneath you as your second in command to take over for you. So Chief Coaching went that process. We've had several other appointments. And in this case, we have a very capable second in command, 28 year employee um, with credentials that, uh, that uh, you see in the backup. In fact, there was a time three, four, five years ago where Temple Terrace tried to steal him to be their finance director, and we were able to, to keep them from doing that to keep him here. 
So I'd like to recommend, and it needs to be ratified by this board to, upon uh, on January 12, 2015, to appoint Ron Herring as the finance director for the city of Tarpon Springs. Thank you. You know, first I just say uh, that uh, we wish uh, Ari the, the best as far as in her retirement. You know, she has definitely served the city very uh, well, um, and we didn't have to, anything to be concerned about for his finances. But uh, with, with Ron and Mr. Aaron, is, you know, I uh, had a chance to be around for a little while, both as up here, but just as a citizen. And um, Ron has always impressed me as an individual that's not only hardworking, but does his job and does it in an excellent manner without uh, any fanfare. We know that he's received many awards for his, what he's done fi from a financial perspective. But, you know, to me is that it's, it's rare when, when people remember their position. You know, he's never been one to try to act like, you know, he's the director or try to be in front of the director. And what about me? You know, it's my time, you know, he's always been a person that's done his job well in the, in the, uh, in the background. And I was saying to someone privately, and I say it publicly, is that we appreciate that type of employee. And when you can bring that type of person forward who's already prepared to do the job and to do the job excellently, but also do it with a manner of humility, you know, I can definitely <coughs> support uh, this as we move forward, you know. Any comments or I motion? Move approval. Second. Any public comments on this item? Roll call. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Mr. Banther? Yes. Mr. Terrapin? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, audits and resolution, item number 15, auditors 2014-17, application 14-66, a minute uh, right of way vacation for Bayshore Heights. Uh, this is the second read. Ordinance 2014 17, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, vacating and abandoning right of way for portions of Kajaput and DeSoto Way between Loquat Drive and Bayshore Drive, providing for conditions, providing for findings, providing for future easements, providing for recordation of the public records of Pinellas County, and providing an effective date in the second reading of Ordinance 2014 17 by title only. It's published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on December 5, 2014. We have had a quasi-judicial hearing on this ordinance one time before, um, and so at this time I would ask for city and applicant to uh, let us know if anything's changed in the interim. Um, if you want to speak, I'd also ask you to raise your right hand and be sworn. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give in this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but? Thank you. Karen Lemons, Economic Development Manager. Um, this is a request to um, a small adjustment to the vacation of the Kajaput and DeSoto um, right of ways for the Bayshore Heights project that was previously approved um, in conjunction with the site plan that reconfigured um, Kajaput and DeSoto as a looped street rather than two straight uh, dead end streets. Um, the looping of the street requires a small amount of additional vacation to accommodate the curve um, nature of the street connections. Um, the looping provides better circulation, also provides um, better access for the fire department vehicles. Um, the application was reviewed by TRC with no objections, was approved by the um, Board of Commissioners at first reading on December 2nd. There were four review criteria in each case. The applicant met all of the criteria. Um, they were read um, last meeting. I don't know if I need to read those again. They're in your backup. Um, staff recommends approval of the amended variance and the uh, additional right-of-way was calculated in the original application fee. Um, so the, the total of 19384 um, has already been tended to the city. No questions for uh, Ms. Lemons, Casey.
Good evening, uh, Casey Krauser on behalf of Bel Air Capital Group, 2265 North McMullen Booth Road, Clearwater. Um, don't really have any comments. This is just a second hearing. If you guys have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Seeing none, are there any members of the public who wish to speak in opposition to the application? Not opposition in either Pros 901 Bayshore Drive. Just clarification, uh, if I may, please, on this vacating of the right of way, did they pay for this? Yes. And how much? I think Karen just read into the record offhand. I don't know. I didn't Nin hear. I'm sorry. 19,384. 19 okay. Just so I don't know. But, uh, and, all the vacating of the right-of-ways for Bayshore all the way up in this development, they paid for the vacating of all the right-of-ways. Yeah, they pay the application fee that's required from the, by the ordinance. Yes, okay. ma'am. And do you remember what that was? $750 total. For the application fee in addition to the 19000 and change. Okay. Thank you. Any members of the public wishing to speak in support of the application? Does either the city or the applicant wish to make a closing statement or summary? Mr. Mayor. Chair would entertain a motion if there are no further comments or questions. We have approval. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, item number 16, resolution 2014-38, budget resolution for fiscal year 2015. Resolution 2014-38, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2014-15. Resolution 2014-38 by title only. It's welcome. <laughs> yes, um, this is the first budget resolution for fiscal year 2015. It's to carry forward the uh, encumbrance that were outstanding at the end of 2014 to bring forward the donation account balances as well as um, to enter in items that were discussed in the budget process, but not including it, included in the working copy of the budget that was adopted back in September. Um, it also includes um, the pay raises um, that were in the presentation, the amount that um, was budgeted or intended to be budgeted um, that was discussed. Um, there is money that um, has not been allocated um, to the police and f fire pensions yet, um, and that is provided for in this as well. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. A question for Ms. Walker? Mr. Mayor. Oh, uh, Commissioner Sharpen. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Walker, on the second page, Towards the bottom, construction fund improvements other than building, 2.2 million, 27,000 and change. What's that? Th number? That is um, for the water and sewer construction, and it's to provide the money for um, the Eleanor Boulevard um, and. A generator. It, there's a, a um, generator that's like 900, and that was over a million dollars um, that was not included in the um, bond. For the RO? Proceeds. It's, it's, it, it's for the RO plant. Mm -hmm. So the Most balance of that $2 million and change is for underground utilities on Eleanor Boulevard? Eleanor Boulevard and that. Um, the generator? Generator. 
and part of Eleanor Boulevard is being paid for out of the penny fund for the part that relates to the city portion, not the RO plant requirement. And, and the generator that was over a million dollars was not included? Uh, it's not in the Wharton Smith contract. Uh -huh. um, and it's something that we need. In fact, in the future, they'll be um, providing for another one because they really need it for redu redundancy. Um, with the power, should there be a problem with Duke Energy? And the reason we're seeing it tonight is because it was we weren't aware of that during the regular budget meetings. It, um, it was carried forward. Um, we hadn't budgeted for it, and then when we found that there was going to be money available um, through some savings in the contract, um, we we're entering it now. On the the uh, Eleanor Boulevard. I uh, was told they plan to have that contract awarded before the, the end of September, and that's why it, it wasn't put in the budget for the current year. The generator or Eleanor Boulevard? Eleanor Boulevard. And the generator, we were waiting to see if we were going to have enough money to actually budget it um, for the project. <coughs> for the RO project? I'm sorry? For the RO project? Yes. That's all. Fund 404 is the RO budget. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Walker? Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't have any questions at this time. I really just wanted to express my gratitude, Ms. Walker, to you for your many years of service to the city of Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe, did a motion? Move for approval. Second. Second. Any uh, public comments on this item? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Tierpenny? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. <coughs> uh, item number 17, resolution 2014-39, Public Works Reorganization. If it's okay with, with you, the mayor, the next four items um, go together. So... Um, I think the best way to handle it is to have the city attorney read all four of them. We'll make one presentation because they're all interconnected, and then we'll go back and vote individually on each one. If that's fine with the board. And so. Resolution 2014-39, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing changes in the public works organization, including division name changes in building maintenance, marina roads and streets and stormwater, Title change and position upgrade for building maintenance supervisor, transfer water distribution and sewage collection to the Public Service Department and Public Services to transfer stormwater to Public Works, combining a vacant and transferring stormwater positions in order to add new streets and stormwater supervisor position, adding newly created fleet assistant position and vehicle maintenance, transferring Public Works division supervisor position to development services, revising job descriptions, job titles, job pay grades, and compensation within the Public Works divisions, and providing for an effective date hereof. Here it's resolution 2014-39 by title only. Resolution 2014-40, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing changes in the organization of the building, Depart building Development Department, specifically including modifying position title of Supervisor of Inspections to Building Development Supervisor, modifying position title of Engineering Project Supervisor to Project Supervisor, and adding limited supervisory duties and on-call capability, transferring and retitling position of public work supervisor to projects coordinator, revising associated position descriptions, and providing for an effective date hereof. It's resolution 2014-40 by title only. Resolution 2014-41, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing changes in departmental organization to create the separate departments of building development, planning and zoning, and information technology, and providing for an effective date hereof. Resolution 2014-41 by title only. And Resolution 2014-42, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing changes in the organization of utilities functions within the Public Services Department and Public Works Department, specifically including adding functions and associated staffing for the reverse osmosis water supply facility to the Public Services Department, transferring functions and associated staffing of the Water Distribution Division from the Public Works Department to the Public Services Department, transferring functions and associated staffing of the Sewage Collection Division 
from the Public Works Department to the Public Services Department. Transferring functions and associated staffing of the stormwater division from the Public Services Department to the Public Works Department. Combining administrative assistance duties of public services and planning. Revising associated pay grades, position descriptions, and compensation, and providing for an effective date hereof. It's resolution 2014 42 by title only. Basically, to set this up, this is something we've been working on and looking at for a long time. Um, we've done some minor work reorganization things over the past year, year and a half to prepare for this. Um, obviously, it helped to come out of the economic times we're in. The main two things we've been looking at in all of this time, and of course, we've had some change over of top personnel that's you know, made this come together, but the main things we've been looking for is efficiency, accountability, better service to the community, and an organizational structure that takes advantage of those things to give us the efficiency and the accountability that we think we need. Um, I've talked to many of you about, uh, about different areas of this. Um, we have brainstormed it internally for a while. Um, I want to ch thank Chief Coaching. Chief Coaching came in from all of our brainstorming and kind of came in as the outside listener to look at everything, have everybody talk about it again, and put together a total organizational change that would go into effect uh, at the beginning of the next year. Um, and everything we've learned um, to make projects go better, um, for the advancement of some of our employees, to give opportunities of our own employees to advance, and we've come up with this package. And I guess we'll start off, uh, Chief Coach, if you just give an overview <coughs> of where we're going organizationally, and then have each of the areas come up and just give the highlights of what we're doing in those organizations for the, the public and the commission. Okay, thank you. Um, as you know, over the last several months, um, myself, city manager, Paul Smith, Tom Function, Anthony Mastraccio, Ari Walker, and several others have really been looking at you know, organizational structure and looking for synergies and looking for efficiencies. And one of the things that we learned in the police department going through accreditation for almost three years is that one word, organizational structure. Um, if you look real quick at, at the proposed citywide organizational charts in tab 19 of your books, um, pretty much the way you always structure your, you know, your organizational structure based on your operational needs. And this is really a simple structure. It's a straight line organizational chart with 11 department heads accountable to their divisions reporting right to the city manager. We kind of broke away the old um, development services department uh, where you have one department head overseeing three different departments. That's gone. Those departments are now independent. It enhances creativity, it enhances communication. And again, everyone reports directly to the city manager. I also believe it increases teamwork. Um, a lot of the changes beyond this that you're going to see, uh, the vast majority of them are in public services and public work, especially because we have a $45, $50 million RO plan coming online. And there's a lot of things that we had to do with that, hiring employees, hiring people that specialize in that area. It's a major operation. Also, the building department, there was some changes there and some vision on how to move forward to, you know, to create efficiency. So um, if the city manager has no problem with it, I'd like to kind of have some of the department heads come up and just give a brief overview of, of some of their structure, structural changes that they did, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director, and uh, I'll be brief here, just uh, focusing on the utilities portions, which is Resolution 2014-42. Uh, from the mem memoranda provided in your backup, uh, a summary of the benefits of the proposed plan for the utilities operations changes. We're going to establish clear lines of responsibility, uh, simplified organization in our vital compliance operational areas. I want to provide consistent position structures across utility operations. Our structure is going to be more standardized to local government utility operations. We're going to provide apprenticeship positions with opportunity for advancement and encourage more promotion from within. We want to provide competitive wage grades so as to ensure positions remain filled with qualified candidates. And finally, there's no planned demotion of position wage grades, salary reductions, or elimination of filled positions without transfer to an equivalent or higher position. 
So just to summarize again from the utilities perspective, and this follows the uh, Exhibit 1 in this item, the uh, organizational chart, items 1 through 5. Uh, item number 1, we're adding functions for the RO water supply facility to the Public Services Department. Item number two, we're transferring functions from the Water Distribution Division of Public Works over to Public Services so that it's integrated with our water operations. We want to transfer functions of the Sewage Collection Division from Public Works to the Public Services Department so it's integrated with wastewater operations. We want to transfer function and associated staffing of the Stormwater Division from Public Services to the Public Works Department so that it's integrated with Public Works operations and specifically with streets. And finally, we want to combine administrative assistance duties of the Public Services Department and planning to share resources and provide additional administrative support for planning and economic development functions. To summarize from an economic standpoint, uh, the efficiencies of combining these functions together, uh, we're anticipating to accommodate this within our existing operational revenue. We reviewed it with our rate consultant to confirm that this can be supported by our approved rate plan. I'd like to make a last note about job descriptions, and this applies to each of the reorganizations that have job descriptions attached. This utilities one has about 170 pages of job descriptions. I'd like to tell you we do our very best to bring you the final drafts in the backup, but there may be some editorial errors, and we're also reviewing some of the, um, some of the job descriptions with the labor attorney to make sure the exempt status is correct. That's a very detailed analysis. It's best left to an expert. So if there are any changes as a result of any of that, I just would like you to know that we'll make those final edits as part of finalizing the job descriptions. Thank you for um, your attention to this. If I can answer any questions on the utilities. Whichever way you want. If you I, I, I don't have any uh, specific questions, so I'll, I'll wait for a comment. Good evening. Tom Function, Public Works Director. Uh, <clears throat> I echo many of the words that uh, Paul has just said about the reorganization. Um, this gives us some opportunities here that uh, we hadn't had before, as far as the synergy, as, as uh, oh. Captain Cochin had mentioned. Uh, this also gives opportunities. I'm sorry. <laughs> Captain. <laughs> We're going to eat those walnuts tonight, you know. <laughs> well, if you're on my good side, maybe get back up there again. Uh, this gives the opportunity to uh, do a number of things. First is uh, look at job descriptions throughout the departments. <clears throat> uh, for consistency, we're going to move uh, all the positions into a job family, i.e., the tech ones, tech twos, tech threes. Um, and then uh, this will give us opportunities along the way here. The first thing we need to do is uh, change building maintenance to Facilities maintenance. Uh, Marina would name change to waterfronts, which incorporate the uh, Dodecanes and the uh, Splash Park, and any, of course, any other waterfronts that we may need in the future. Uh, there will be a position upgrade uh, from the building maintenance supervisor to a facilities management superintendent. That's a uh, move up from grade 14 to a 19. Uh, he will oversee a facilities management division, which will include facility maintenance, yard waste, solid waste, parks, parkways, and waterfronts. That position there will have to be compelled to bid in-house. Uh, the gentleman that that will affect is very aware, aware of that, and uh, he's on board, and he looks forward to uh, that opportunity. Uh, transfer the ward division to public services, transfer the sewage collection to public services, and then give the opportunity to bring the stormwater division into public works, which, again, will work hand-in-hand -hand with roads and streets. As most people know, that the condition of a water system has a direct effect on the drivability of your streets and vice versa. The condition of your roadway has a direct effect on stormwater. Um, new stormwater division will be called Streets, uh, uh, streets and Stormwater. Uh, that will, will, will be taking the MPDS coordinated position, which is presently vacant right now, and combine that with the administrative secretary, which will be moving over to the water plant and open up a new Streets and Stormwater supervisor position. That will be a new position that will be competitively bid uh, out on the street. Uh, Vehicle maintenance will also create a fleet position uh, to help with some assistance in the fleet department. As you know, uh, stormwater is much like, fleet is much like stormwater, there's a lot of regulatory requirements. So with additional help there, it will help us keep us compliant. Uh, as a result of these multiple department title changes, coming to a job family, uh, there will be some increases to number of employees, uh, mostly my frontline employees, the lower pay grade employees will be moving from anywhere from grade five to grade six. They will automatically receive, uh, if this is approved, 
a 5% increase to either existing pay or, or at the bottom of the next grade level up that will actually help about 20 of my employees that, that uh, truly deserve it. Um, there will be one other sl slight change here. We will be adding, uh, uh, and this is not probably in your backup, but uh, as far as a policy here, we created a city arborist, uh, ISA certified arborist uh, that will be able designated by the city manager with a 15% increase. Uh, there will be a second city arborist, again, designated as for, through the city manager when needed as ISA certified arborist municipal specialist. Uh, <laughs> that will give a lot, a lot of my employees the opportunity to increase their certifications and also uh, give them the opportunity to increase their pay. Uh, we'll be doing that through all our departments, including fleet maintenance, as they get their ASC certifications. So we'll give them an opportunity to increase their salary. So we'll give the, all the employees an opportunity to empower themselves to actually have control of their own salaries. Uh, last but not least, uh, we will be moving the transfer of the Public Works Division Supervisor over development services uh, under the new title of project coordinator. Uh, Anthony can explain that a little bit more, but he's done a lot of those same duties within public works, uh, <laughs> and it'll be a great fit. It will actually help us perform a lot more of our, our projects. Any questions? I'm open. Now we'll go to the next presentation. Good evening, uh, Anthony Mastraccio, Building Development Director. As Mr. Function just indicated, uh, with the transfer of his employee over to the Building Division, what that does, it's going to combine all our projects into one location. So it's a one-stop shop. All the city projects that come in have to go through our department. What that does is uh, we have a fine line now, so now we can go through permitting much quicker, plan review will be much quicker, and they also can utilize all my inspectors. So if there's any questions, it's all in-house. Um, the other change that we had was building um, development supervisor. That was my last position before becoming director. And basically we concentrated on the inspection side. We're changing this as a supervisor to oversee the entire division under my direction. They will, um, I'll have the ability now to provide that customer service. Currently, as we all know, the plan review time has uh, increased lately. So we're looking at 14, maybe to 20 business days for a simple shed permit. So if you come into the division now, um, once this individual is hired and his position is filled, we anticipate dropping that down um, to the same day permitting. So when you come in with a shed permit, we'll be able to review that right away, issue that permit while you're still in the office. Um, same thing with commercial. You're at 25 business days now for a commercial plan review. Uh, we anticipate cutting that in half. This individual, the supervisor, will be in-house doing that plan review. Um, I'd say 99% of their time under my direction. And what it does, it just facilitates a quicker plan review and turnaround time, which I think enhances the city overall. Um, you know, these changes are all, as you know, Chief Cochin had indicated, pres you know, in the past, we had building development, um, IT, and planning and zoning under the same division. With this separated apart, now I have the ability just to concentrate on building <coughs> development, and we can move it into the future. Um, I want to start pushing and have online permitting. Um, also, if contractors or homeowners are not at their house at time of inspection, they'll be able to go online, check that inspection instantly. Um, it'll be hands-on. I want to empower the inspectors and give them iPads so as soon as they leave your house, they can enter their inspection and it is real time. Within one minute, uh, you'll have your inspection results you know, available to you. And what this also does with this program, um, it gives them a lot of you know, quicker response time. Anything they do on your house, as soon as they punch it up on an iPad, they'll see every permit ever pulled on your house, every inspection ever done on your house eliminates the phone calls into the office. All the inspectors now have iPhones, so email capability, phone capability, texting. Um, they could take pictures back and forth. So we're really trying to push it into the future. Any questions? Uh, no, is that the last one? Yep. <clears throat> I, I just say first is that uh, when I had a chance to 
review this and talk with some of the individuals. I, I thought that, you know, it was <clears throat> a well thought out reorganization from the perspective of some of the various departments have been, <clears throat> excuse me, lumped together for better efficiency. And sometimes it's hard to change some things um, in terms of looking outside of the box and trying to put together those uh, uh, various uh, departments that should be together or some uh, divisions within uh, a department that's better served somewhere else. But I was especially pleased by the things that's happening as far as with uh, permitting and what Mr. Uh, Mr. Ossio would talked about as far as online permitting things that we know that as we set up here, people come talk to us about why don't we do some things. Other cities are doing it. Having to hear from people about how long it takes for permits and the rest of that, all of that I think helps to move us into the future, but everything that's been brought, I can uh, definitely support. I know that a lot of this uh, <coughs> is happening too in terms of hiring is because of the mm -hmm. RO plant that we're gonna be bringing online, but in doing that, there's some other things that's happening and. Uh, I always tell Mr. Function that he could use some more help over there where he's at. So a lot of these things kind of help, I think, us to be a better city. And, you know, sometime in terms of uh, moving forward and, and actually um, saving money, you have to spend some money because I think that within our building, the, the department and permitting this stuff, we lose a lot when we can't get people in and out. Then people start to do things without permits. It's like if it take me 23 days to get a shed permit, why don't I just put the shed up and hope they don't catch me, you know? Uh, because, you know, it just takes too long. It's not that they don't want to comply, but, you know, time is money. So I'm, I'm pleased that a lot of these things are taking place as we move forward and, and all of the various departments are working together uh, not feeling that you're giving me something or taking away something from me, but how can we work more efficiently together? So I just say that I appreciate the way that this thing has come about and uh, the role that I started to just call him captain just to see what he would say. <laughs> but <laughs> chief coach and, and his uh, input into the whole process. So with that, uh, Commissioner Tarpani. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I also just want to say how important I think it is for for us as a city to constantly be looking at uh, better ways to make ourselves more efficient for, for the apartments or departments to be run more efficiently um, and, and ultimately leading to a, a better end result for uh, the residents and our city as a whole to operate as basically a business. Um, so with that, I just, I would thank, I thank you. I thank you for the hard work that went into this. Um, I think splitting off some of the departments that were under, under the development services department um, is extremely wise and, and will be well recepted uh, by many within the community. Uh, I think that's a, a thought that a lot had um, is that those need to be separate from the uh, development services. Um, and each and every one of you uh, have my utmost confidence as your, as the directors of your departments um, and, uh, professional um, respect so thank you very much yes I also want to thank you I know that this took a lot of time and effort and I appreciate uh, all the hard work that went into it uh, I enjoyed meeting with you all individually and and getting all this information I know that uh, brought up the uh, online application process to you Anthony because I I find that we need to be much more efficient in, in that area and to move forward as some other cities so I really appreciate uh, be working on that and uh, thank you oh, thank you yes I, um, ju <laughs> just as well I, I am excited about this process I think we're taking a, a good step forward as a city and streamlining our, our, our all of our processes and how people report in, in different departments but like it's been said I, I am most excited about this about, about the, the, this new permit uh, process uh, that is one of the the high the high the highest complaints that that uh, we get, and I think you'll find we're going to get more compliance with having an easier process, 
and thus and thus just have a a, a better outcome uh, um uh just 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 overall so i so i i i am thankful for uh each of you for what what you've done and your hard work thank you thank you no i just want to say i think this is a step toward uh improved efficiency which obviously is a positive thing and i'd like to say thank you to all involved for their efforts <laughs> With that, uh, any public comments on this item? Marty Peters, uh, 1702 Heritage Oaks Court, and also Vice Chair of the Budget Advisory Committee. I'd also like to uh, add that the uh, Budget Advisory Committee has uh, often talked about increased efficiency and providing better services. and. Uh, I think this will go a long way towards doing that, and uh, I'm impressed with what the uh, city manager has come up with as far as a reorganization plan, and it deals with many of those things that uh, we've raised as concerns, uh, but in a much broader way of handling it, and uh, I think that'll be a good thing overall. Question, though. Uh, overall, uh, is this reorganization uh, going to uh, affect the budget by increasing costs, lowering costs, or is it revenue neutral? And uh, I would expect that it might actually be a little bit more expensive because we're um, offering more services, uh, particularly with the RO plant, and also some of the uh, greater efficiencies uh, to provide those services. But uh, I'm interested, which is it? I don't know. Do you have the numbers there? I, got, I have numbers. Okay. Um, to the general fund, $20,000. Um, the rest of them are enterprise funds, sanitation, $5,200. Water and sewer, $110,000. Again, we're adding a lot more employees for the RO plant. Uh, Stormwater, $56,000. Vehicle maintenance, $4,700. Um, and we had finance um, obviously run all these numbers for us. And when you're dealing with enterprise funds, the rate consultants uh, concur that this will not. In other words, the rate, this is within the rate structure that we currently charge. So it's not going to affect the rate structure at this point. So it's within the budget, so to speak. Thank you. And that was one of the main things about as we we're talking again, as he said, the budget, the budget committee, we've talked about all these things and the ability with positions moving and stuff to have minimal <coughs> effect on the budgets I told you at budget time that we would have this coming forward but really as far as the general fund we already anticipated the enterprise funds and what monies we need for the water plant but we really needed to do this um, in a way where we didn't have a great effect on the general fund budget and as you see from that to do all these changes and have that small of amount on there and again I would suggest to you that you know that will pay for itself and uh, save money with the efficiencies and stuff we're going to see savings of money but that was a real important process to take all the ideas we've got from commissioners budget advisory committee and as we've looked at this a year and try to put something together that again our bottom line of keeping for our plan for the reserves and the general fund budget that we do it with as little as possible and the, the team has has accomplished that and been able to do that as you see so this is very little impact on the general fund budget um, to do all these changes that you see here well, thank you um, with that there are no other comments shall we entertain a motion yeah, do one at, yeah you need some separate oh, motions so uh, take, yeah uh, we 2014 38 first and then uh, look at uh, item number 17 resolution 2014 or is it, excuse me it's 39 is first uh, yeah uh, that's yeah 24 uh, 24 2014 39 uh, public works reorganization so moved second roll call Mr. Sieber Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Item number 18 is resolution 2014 40, Building Development Department Reorganization. Move to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Item number 19, resolution 2014 41, uh, separation of building. Uh, development Planning and Zoning and Information Technology Department. So moved. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. 
Vice Mayor Larson, yes. Mayor Archie. Yes, and item number 20 is resolution 2014-42, Public Services Utility Reorganization. So move, roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't have a motion. So move. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Thank all of you all that was involved in this project, and we look forward to uh, the improvements. <clears throat> Item number 21 is Ordinance 2014-18, uh, application 1433, vacating the portion of Pine Street, right of way of US 19 to Jasmine Street, second reading. Ordinance 2014-18, an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, vacating right of way for a portion of Pine Street, providing for recordation of the public records of Pinellas County and providing an effective date. It's ordinance 2014-18, second reading uh, by title only. Uh, it'll be published, excuse me, we've had a, we, before I get too far into this, we've had a uh, advertising issue with this ordinance. Uh, and so what we're going to request tonight is to uh, defer hearing this uh, item a second time until the January 13, uh, 2015 meeting. That would be Janu January, January 27. I apologize, January 27, you're right, January 27, uh, due to the advertising snafu that uh, occurred. Okay. Um, do we take a motion to defer, or do you want to do public comment first? Um, you can take public comments if there's anyone here to comment on the item. But I'd ask Anybody you would like to comment on this, uh, knowing that this is going to really be heard on the 27th? Uh, so, thank you. So, just uh, note that this uh, item will be taken up on January 27th, 2014. Could you get a motion for deferral to that date? Move to Mr. defer. Thank you. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Miscellaneous item number 22A, Units Drive Discussion and Decision on whether to proceed with this project. Let me just start off by talking about some added information. Um, there's some information we've added to the backup at the request from um, commissioners. Um, again, this is, this is looking at Units and the ability of the city to do it. One of the questions that came up and I should have put a better cover in here so you all of a sudden see something about Spruce Street and that you know what it was. The question is what streets are, are out there to do um, that we've committed to. Um, first of all, I know we've had a lot of talk about mirrors. Uh, my understanding is the lawsuit in the issue hopefully is going to be resolved very soon, eminently. Um, that issue is going to be over, and with it over, we'll be having somebody coming back to us to talk about the project. And of course, any project that you do on that land, they have to put in mirrors. So, hopefully, if everything gets signed and dotted, and we have a resolution, um, I've been told that immediately, uh, possibly as soon as January, that we will have, you know some proposals and some talks and some people <laughs> will be coming about the development of the land by the hospital and of course that would necessitate them building mirrors so mm -hmm. when the question comes out about what streets affected we've had budgeted in the CIB for many years um, to do the engineering design of the Spruce Street extension that is out there um, one of the main issues with Spruce Street of course is um, a development that's going on that you've um, heard about that started through the process by Mr. Lindy Akis um, and uh, the ability of that development to take some stormwater issues. We've priced it out as best as we can and again the Spruce Street is going to be in conjunction with that project going in because if that project doesn't go in then you're talking about a lot of costs for stormwater us buying land so it's kind of dynamic as Mr. Lindy Akis is going through the process. Um, you know, Spruce Street is going to be tied with it. But if everything goes with the project and we're able to do it, you see we have a pricing that was done. Again, it's, it's you know, very rough pricing, but the ability that doing that road is going to be 234000 um, well within the 300 and um, the, the, uh, the money that we have available, uh, 310865 
um, that we have in the transportation impact fund now. That leads to, you know, some money left, approximately $50,000 if that goes, but the ability to do units. When we've talked about doing units and stuff, one of the important things of doing it is obviously some other sources of money. We've identified, and the city attorney will have some information if you want to consider it, the ability to assess the property owners for some of that money. We do have some fines out there, um, whether that we dealt with the last time, um, and this commission said they would settle for an amount of money. Um, the initial reaction was that the people who had the fines weren't going to pay it, but that's something that's up. There's going to be some fine money paid for there, so that is another source of money. So again. Um, there's some different sources of money out there that um, with that contingency that we could look at if you dedicate the fine money um, or some money, money if you wanted to do units. But again, the money is there and barring any unforeseen things, there's a little bit left. There are other sources of money to consider if you're going to if you're going to decide to put the road through. There are some other sources to do. The only change that has come up as we brought this back forward to you is obviously with the small amount of land um, to put the road in. Um, Mr. Robertson did estimate to put all of the utilities in also, um, the sewer, the water, all the lines in there. Um, that's created a problem that I want the city attorney to talk about. Obviously, one of the conditions we put in the agreement with Bayshore Heights was their ability to do the road for us, which initially probably would save some mobilization fees and some fees. <coughs> Unfortunately, to do the road, we obviously don't want to do a road and then dig it up at a later time to put utilities through. So um, that added money could create a dilemma and um, with a dilemma that the city attorney will talk about of the ability of the, the requirement for us to go out to bid for. Um, and. Uh, you know, thank goodness he noticed that extra park. And we had just been talking about the road, but obviously putting the infrastructure on the thing wouldn't be an impact on the general fund that we have to worry about that transportation, but it would come from water, sewer, storm water, those funds. But um, it put the amount over a threshold. So, so if our city attorney would just talk a little bit about that, and that might change the plans about us, um, how we go about and the ability to having to bid the road. Yeah, thanks again. It was originally uh, conceived, um, at least from my perspective, as you know, pushing the road through, and the the cost to do that did not exceed the statutory threshold under 255.20 uh, that would trigger the necessity of a competitive bid process for public construction works. Um, when the infrastructure, the potable water line, the stormwater facility, et cetera, et cetera, was added in, uh, it exceeded that threshold, as you can see from the project estimate uh, of 300,000, which is a cost indexed um, uh, threshold. And so there are two, uh, two schools of thought on this. Uh, the statute itself does not define the term project. So it's not entirely clear at this juncture, and some of it's dependent on y'all's discussions tonight and moving forward, um, whether we have one project, two projects, or, or a several uh, combination thereof. Um, my point in telling you all that is if this becomes uh, sort of by um, synthesis some sort of a single project, it is possible, um, and as I listen to the discussions tonight, I'll begin to uh, formulate some opinions that it may need to be put out to competitive bid, which obviously defeats the benefit of having the developer who's already out there doing it. The, the idea was to save in mobilization costs is because his men were, or his contractors would all be on site um, building the other roads required by the project. Um, so a again, as we move forward with this process, as I listen to your discussions, um, I'll keep that in mind and, and, uh, and guide you as I can. There are cases out there that are suggesting that you know, a project can't be severed for purposes of avoiding the necessity of, of a competitive bid process. On the other hand, the way this project or these projects sort of were generated uh, organically, I, I think an argument is, uh, can be made and is a good one, frankly, at this juncture that these are two separate projects because they can sus sustain in independently of one another. Because you put a road in does not mean that you necessarily have to, though certainly uh, you probably get benefit of economies of uh, efficiency and scale that you don't always have to go in and put the infrastructure, the accompanying infrastructure in. Um, and so I'm happy to entertain any questions you have about that, but it is possible, at least at this juncture, uh, that a competitive bid process will be necessary 
should we move forward? And then the only other thing I have from the last meeting is there were some residents that, to, that came to see me that were, um, that live along a corridor that was opposed to it. I've asked them if they have opposition or something to say that tonight would be the night to say it because again, if we're looking at putting, if we're looking at doing that road, I need to get to the design and permitting phase because it's probably gonna be a five to six month process. Um, so, if we're going to do it, and one of the ideas, one of the main ideas, if you're going to do the road while they're tearing up the streets and doing all the construction, <laughs> to have all the construction done together, to have that the case where it's not disrupted with one construction project, and then we're going right in and doing a road after it. Um, you know, we would need to, it's not absolutely necessary, obviously, we'd do the road at any time, but to try to coincide with the schedule of the developer, which is, again, it's a schedule that may change. Um, you know, ambitious schedules seem to change a lot in there, but to keep with that, it's gonna take us five to six months to do the design portion, which is 50 in the $50,000 range, the design and permitting for portion to try to catch up. Um, and, and at that time, we were worried about catching up because we wanted to con coincide it with the development, which already had its, its plans and permitting set. So, so again, um, it's a case where tonight you'll listen to the, the citizens for and against. Um, you see there's some options on money. Again, there's one property owner on there who owns six properties. Um, if there is some concern about that and the ability to do the road and the benefit of it, that's where the assessment process would come in. Um, and again, that would be a fund of money to, to do it. If those fines are paid by the people, and again, the fines are from impact of that whole neighborhood out there. So it's real logical to an area and eyesore for 10 or more years that created for that neighborhood. It's, it, would be, it would be a matching thing to take that money from those fines and dedicate it to a, a road project in that area. Um, obviously, if that was paid in full, which I'm not so sure, they may come back and we may be talking about it again, but even if it's a little less than 140,000, I mean, those fines could, could almost potentially be used to pay for a large portion of the, of the road also. So there's assessment, there's the use of the fines if they come in, I'm sure there's gonna be some transportation impact money you could use. So whereas if, if the Lindiacus project goes, Spruce Street goes and you have that money to do that, there are some other avenues to do it. Obviously you could tell me to find money from another project elsewhere and do it, but the other, there are other avenues to use monetarily if, if, if you know, the compelling feeling is to do the road. At the same time, Bayshore Heights is constructed and, and utilize the connectivity and, and separate those roads. Um, you know, utilizing those money sources, uh, that would be something to discuss before we get into the part of B. So um, I think we've got some people that's worked on it. We got, we got Brian Anderson here who worked on some of these figures and knows the area and the layout here. Um, Karen's still here. I know one of the questions in backup was some of the financial impacts um, that could be from developing. So Ms. Lemons is here for some questions. Um, so um, I'll turn it over to you and the uh, discussion of, uh, of this roadway and whether to proceed forward with, with part B of the item. First, I just thank you and staff for <laughs> your input so far. Um, and we deferred this when you was Appreciate that. out because uh, I know you would like to uh, to speak to this. If no one has any objections, objections, maybe we can go to public comments. Then I'll try to listen to everybody I, and see where we go. So what we'll do is anybody that's. Uh, would like to comment on this item as far as this road uh, on Eunice Drive. If you come forward, state your name, address for the record, and you've given up to four minutes. My name is Richard Duncan, 812 Eunice Drive. I had a prepared statement to read at the meeting on December 6th when this item had been postponed. Some new information had come to light that might drastically change what I'm about to read, but uh, as a commitment to the citizens, the residents in that northern section of Eunice Drive, I'll go ahead and read what I had prepared from that December 6th meeting and then let it fall where it may or give whatever weight to it it might have. 
The Tarpon Springs City Commission has approved the residential development of the land bordered by Bayshore Drive, Loquat Drive, and West Bayshore Drive. One or more residents of Bayshore Drive are urging the City Commission to extend Eunice Drive north to where it would intersect with Bayshore Drive. The logic is that while this development of roads and uh, infrastructure is being accomplished, it would be timely to include Eunice Drive in that. The reason for this effort, as we understand it, is that the residents on Bayshore are seeking an alternative route to escape a low area on Bayshore Drive, which floods during rainy season. We, the residents of Eunice Drive, oppose this extension for several reasons. First, in the already approved development plan, West Bayshore Drive is designated to extend northward to intersect Bayshore Drive. This extension will provide Bayshore Drive residents an alternative to circumvent their flood prone area. This road extension is to be funded by the property developers and not by tax dollars from the city of Tarpon Springs. Second, the extension of Eunice Drive shows no promise at that time of home construction in contrast to the area already approved for development. A future developer may decide to build on the northern end of Eunice Drive and thus pay for the extension. Third, the flood, the flood prone area on Bayshore Drive occurs north of the area where Eunice Drive would intersect it. And therefore, that extension would not provide the exit suggested. Finally, the residents of Eunice Drive request that the City Commission deny the extension as it is unnecessary, inappropriate, and would increase unneeded traffic on a small residential street. And again, uh, new information might change that, but this is to represent those residents in the northern area. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anita Prost, 901 Bayshore Drive. Uh, I'm the one who first came up here and asked to be uh, to look at Eunice to open it. I do not have any reason except for the residents on Bayshore. I have a way out when there's a storm. When you hit, the storm comes, the water comes up by the Asimak home where the boat ramp is, and it comes up through the drain. It floods. It floods the homes in the area on the corner of Sunset and Bayshore. You cannot get out sometimes. Then you can come up Bayshore till you hit the lower part of the hill there where they're going to put a drain. But those yards and those homes have flooded, and there's no real guarantee that you'll be able to get through, and I'm going to show you on the map. My concern is for the residents from the corner of Sunset and Bayshore all the way as you come up Bayshore, I'll be able to get out and the people on my street. My lots are used as parking lots for the cars because their garages f flood. We're not going to benefit monetarily from it, but the developers said now's the time to do it while they're out there. And they could help the city with engineering, with the development, and would be the time to do the work while they're doing their road work. It will also open up the area for the lots there the people who have those lots, and will also open up the ability for development to put those lots and taxes into the city. I would like to show, because I've had two commissioners uh, respond to me to come and see the area, and they know the area. If you could, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I know, but nobody can hear you. be a 
a safety route for these residents to get out if there's ever a big storm or any catastrophe can cost us a once a year, 10 year, 12 year, or even a hurricane. We're expecting a huge average bridge crop. If you remember that, that's how some of us would be able to get out. It's an emergency route that we're looking for. And Eunice has been talked about many, many times to open for the safety of the neighborhood. But also a big route to go to the beaches, to the parks, and also be a route to the school. This is why I'm asking you to look at it. There are different levels of roads in the city. This is not near Norwalk. I don't know that we see the bridge open in our lifetime. I hope we do. But it's been talked about for the last 30 or 40 years that I've seen it open. Eunice, they were waiting for developers to come out there to open up, Eunice, for the safety and welfare of the entire neighborhood. Not just Rayshore, but everybody that lives out there. These are the homes that will be affected. And these are the people that are going to be affected by that development. I know that the city I, can find the money I, to do it. I've I been know in you your know what that, that, that I bell means. Bell, sir. Let me finish. Uh, Mayor, I've you heard, can yeah, if you wrap I've it up. Heard, I've heard you talk about safety <clears> and neighborhood. <throat> I urge you to look at this. This is the time to do it. Your transportation modal tells you what the stand is on opening these roads. We have an obligation to open every road in every neighborhood that we can for safety reasons. And this is why I'm coming to the commission. It doesn't benefit me, but it benefits the neighborhood. Uh, good evening, Brian Anderson um, with Stantec. I'm City's Tarpon Spring Stormwater Consultant. One of the things I wanted to mention, uh, the commissioners may want to discuss, is uh, Bob Robertson is having us look at uh, providing a, um, a check valve, so to speak, at the Bayshore and uh, Sunrise intersection where the stormwater system is there, providing a check valve on that system that would prevent stormwater from backing up into the stormwater system at that intersection that would prevent flooding of the roadway during high tides coincide with uh, you know north winds that would push the water uh, up into the bayou and uh, so with the if that were to come through um, as something that the city wanted to move forward with I would see it maybe you know something that would cost the city less than you know fifteen twenty thousand dollars to install that would prevent a lot of the flooding that would occur at that intersection during high tides so I just wanted to add that we well, thank you for that information, Mr. Anderson. Any other public comments on this item? Hi, my name is Manuel Lindiakis. I live at 773 Ancloat Landings Drive, and I'm the uh, owner of the property on Jasmine that we've been talking about that abuts Spruce Street. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what we we were talking about uh, we we are prepared and we've designed our project to accommodate the runoff from spruce uh, prior to the staff changes that occurred this year uh, we were in discussions with the planning department to see you know uh, how we would uh, what the consideration would be for that but it but it would be uh, I think it would be beneficial for everybody because then uh, the city wouldn't have to go purchase land up past Carl Flammer Ford. We wouldn't have to put almost six or seven hundred foot of storm drain pipe to tie into that. Uh, what we've did is we've we've designed and it's already permitted to accommodate the I think the volume that's in that vault that you guys put in at the end of Spruce, and we also put a, a preliminary design of Spruce Street with with the sidewalks and the impervious area, so. We were able to accommodate the stormwater runoff for all of Spruce on my project, uh, which is, I think, going to be a significant amount of savings for the city uh, if, if they choose to you know, work with me on that and, and put Spruce trees through. As far as timing goes, um, uh, 
you know, I don't know anything about this project out in Sunset Hills. I mean, I don't, you know, my understanding, the little I know about it, I mean, I don't think it's even, the deal hasn't even closed as far as the ownership of the property goes, but this is all hearsay. Uh, my understanding, it's the, the guy who has a contract. He's going to get all these things promised to him, and he's going to try to sell it to somebody else to do it. You follow me? There's a difference in that project and my project. I've had this property, with the help of this city, managed to get it to where it is now. Uh, I've been in, owning it for now almost eight years. I went through the <clears throat> economic times. And the good news is, is uh, I've hashed it out with the city commission, uh, the planning department now. I think we're down to one or two little things that I think we're all in agreement. Uh, I've got the swift mud permit. Uh, I've got the extra volume for the city if it needs it. As long as we can reach some type of an agreement, that's fair for me to do the extra work and accommodate for that. Uh, you know, we were supposed to, you know, unfortunately, but we're going to, we're hopefully we're going to be done with the commission meetings by next month, and then I'm going to go straight and pull a permit. I've got my funding in place. So this is a real project that's going to start. Uh, and hopefully the city's going to grant us the phasing opportunity so I can do it in phases. But phase one is going to start uh, as soon as we get done after that February, the January 27th meeting. I'm going to go pull the permit to do the site work. The building department's going to let me start the first building while we're doing that, you know. So my project is a project that's going to start. It's in ownership status now. Uh, so I don't know if it's a, a choice between doing uh, Spruce Street or that street but I think there's a difference in the status of each of those properties. I mean, like I said, I own the property. That guy's going to just, what I heard, get the, get the approval, get the vacation, get their units put in, and then go sell it to somebody else, and who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, I think the city's <clears throat> expended a lot of money on Spruce already. They've, you know, we got a street light there. I think 20 years ago when, when Ms. Protus was the mayor, she got a uh, live oak put through for a reason, but it's never really got its full value. I mean, it does, it does have its value now, but if we can get, you know, there's hundreds of families that live back where, where I live. You got North Lake, not live, but where my project is. You got North Lake community, Sail Harbor, you got those mobile home parks, you got that other, you know, there's hundreds of people, families that could benefit from Spruce. And, you know, I don't know what the, what the lawyer was talking about. You know, if, if our equipment's out there moving dirt around, I mean, there, we could probably put that road in if, if it's allowed without going through the bidding process for a lot less than 300000 I mean, I think he said you got 300 budgeted, and then you could probably for 220 But there's no utilities going in there. It's just a road. just wrap it up to have muscle in that. So, you know, I'm, I'd appreciate it if you consider putting that road in, you know, I mean. I think it would benefit, and I'm, I stand ready and willing to, to get into discussions with the city to accommodate the storm drains for a fair consideration, and uh, I think it would be great for everybody. Thank you. With that, we'll uh, close public comments, and I'll go to Commissioner Tarpani first, and then we'll kind of work our way around. Thank you, Mayor. I, <clears throat> I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak, and I certainly appreciate uh, the board's consideration and deferring this item uh, at a meeting where I couldn't be present. Um, I'll first start by saying that the extension of Eunice Drive is something that I've determined important um, to the city back when D.R. Horton had this property under contract. Um, I think the record will refl reflect that I felt it important at that period of time and consistently have felt it important throughout the discussion of the Bayshore Heights project. <clears throat> I feel it's important for a number of reasons. Um, one was discussed tonight in terms of evacuation. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but I will say that West Bay Shore, which is being put through by Bel Air Capital, uh, will not service all of Bay Shore Drive as an evacuation route from, from Sunset, which is where Mrs. Asimak lives, um, further, I guess it would be kind of northwest. Um, you do reach that hole, um, which was talked about, which does flood. So there is a portion of Bayshore Drive that will not be able to utilize or exit um, onto West Bayshore or onto Sunset. Um, so there is 100% that element of evacuation that is important to me. Um, what's also important to me, and it is defined in our comprehensive plan, is uh, the element of connectivity. 
Um, it's within our comprehensive plan. It, in a nutshell, it states that um, if there is a road that intersects another road and is not put through and there's an opportunity to put it through, you put it through. Um, and there's a number of reasons why you do that. Um, it's, it's found within the comprehensive plan and the multimodal element, which Ms. Proto spoke about. Um, there were a lot of things that were discussed um, in prior meetings, whether to put the road through or not. Um, you never, I never like to see this board uh, at odds. I always like to see, for the most part, um, a consensus. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. There's no hard feelings either way. Um, but to speak about some of those things that were talked about in, in prior meetings, um, Mears Boulevard was discussed. Uh, I think it's been aired that Mears Boulevard, um, one way or another, is not impacted by the extension of Eunice Drive. Um, is that right, Mr. LaCourse? Yes, it okay. should be, again, with the settlement, we should be entering new dis discussions about the development of that property. And again, you've got it set so that can't be developed without them building mirrors. Thank you. So you can check that off the list. Mirrors Boulevard is not tied to Eunice Drive. Um, the other road that was, that was talked about is the extension of Spruce Street. Um, that's also been discussed, that that is not affected by the extension of Eunice Drive. Um, there's the funding issue, which is not an issue. Um, that's been discussed, Mr. LaCourris. Is there any issue funding uh, the extension of Eunice Drive? Is, is there adequate funding for that? Again, as, as the board would make a decision, there are several ways you go. The dedication of the fine money, the assessment process that you have in your backup, the commissioner, and I would, I would emphasize that one of the processes of funding it with one of those two sources, as opposed to going out there and displacing another project, um, there are those avenues, fines, and again, and again, talking about assessing the property owners on that street, especially the one with most effect is the individual who has the six properties on there. And with an assessment process, um, you could you could recoup as they develop, and hopefully, you know, if we get into the, you know, again, a discussion. I know some may be for assessment, some maybe not, but the ability to first of all come what that assessment would be, and then if we have the ability, the attorney gives us the ability to access it when it's developed, and that's when, for instance, they want to develop those places, the person with the six lots would then pay that assessment. Um, that's something to get with the, attor the attorney on those alternate funds to do, but there are those other, other avenues on those, the project to be able to use to get the amount of money you need for the road, um, thinking that the design can be done with the rest of the money from the transportation impact. You're talking about somewhere between 120 and 150 for the road. Um, your avenue using those sources could be how, how you would fund it. And again, I know it's thrown a little curve with the competitive bid process, but again, there's people competing for projects. So, you know, not so sure that in a competitive process, we may come close to the price we may have got from the developer. I don't know if the developer, Bayshore Heights, you know, whoever the person is doing that might put in a bid with all this stuff mobilized. So you know, if I was doing a project out there, I certainly would put a, do a bid to do a campaign. So there's other processes with the bids where, where it may be concerned that we don't get that fifteen to $20,000 savings for the mobilization. Um, it's not so uncertain that that wouldn't work itself out in the big bid process. But again, that's an unknown. So Thank you. those are all the different financial elements that we could consider. So, so per the city manager, there's multiple funding avenues that can be had with Eunice Drive. Um, so that's, that's checked off the list. Um, to me, this is, this is really an opportunity, not an obligation. Um, it was talked about tonight, an opportunity that we discussed in previous meetings about a cost saving with the, the developer and, and uh, to put it in terms of economies of scale. That element may or may not be available to us. Um, there was never discussion on whether or not the developer was going to pay for the road. Um, the city is going to pay for it one way or another. So do you do it now or do you do it later? Do you meet the element of connectivity now or do you meet it later? Um, to speak to the gentleman uh, who, who represented some opposition within the neighborhood, um, I can appreciate that. Everybody likes to live at the end of a dead end street. Um, it's nice and quiet down there, um, but in, 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 uh, it is in fact a platted road. Um, there are other people who are not in the audience tonight who have seen me personally who said, hey, keep on pushing. We want to see Eunice Drive extended. Um, and that's just the element of a public meeting. Some people speak for it. Some people speak against it. Um, so there's also the element of 
the impact on our, our roads, the city's roads, the city's infrastructure. When you have those haul trucks, when you're doing a, a, a huge project like this, there's damage that can be done to the roads. So why not do it all at once? To me, it's an opportunity. It makes sense. Um, it makes sense within our comprehensive plan. The money's in place. There's no negative impact on any other road project. Um, and it's something that I feel like is important. I always have, and I'd like to see it passed tonight. And uh, I'd like to make a motion to um, authorize staff, staff to proceed with the design phase. Well, we're not in a motion phase yet, sir. So we could just do discussions, and then you have an opportunity to make a motion if you still choose. Um, what I do is, uh, Mr. Banther was uh, at the last meeting. Sharing with me why I should be more open minded, so I'm still, still there. I, I well, thank you. Um, first off, just um, I, I, I just Mark, could you help me again, just un understand completely that um, putting 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 through units when it w uh, would uh, would not would not uh, 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 the affect Spruce at all, according to time frame and the the one cost. Now, right now, the money is, as you can see from Ms. Walker, one of the original mm -hmm. documents you got from that m money, um, with, <laughs> with the looking ahead that Mr. Lindiakis' project is going to go through, because that changes the whole aspect. Spru Spruce Street will train, change dramatically. If he doesn't put it through, you're talking about acquiring, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars added to the price. So he's going through the process if that goes through as you can see the cost estimated and i had them double check obviously again there's contingencies once you go in there could be some but the whole cost of 200 we've already got the hundred the the money for the all the design and design of the infrastructure in there and it may be some less two hundred and thirty thousand dollars is the estimate right now in conjunction with that project that you would do it so in essence you're that, leaving, that's for spruce the two thirds for spruce right. so in essence you've got somewhere around fifty thousand sixty thousand left in the transportation impact fees after that for another project again combining that with if you decide if that again and it's we got a lot of yes but if that fine money is the 240 or something that you approve somewhere around there or they come in and negotiate for less, whatever that money, 140, 80, 100,000, you could dedicate that money. And again, that, that money is from fines from that whole neighborhood being an eyesore for all those years. So you could, I think, you know, logically, you putting that money into the neighborhood where it does, that money could be put in. Or again, the other alternative to do and not affect anything else in the budget is the assessment process and assess those property owners when they develop this stuff. So that's where the money would come in to do those ifs. If I just want to make sure Spruce Street would still be re ready to go because it sounds like um, that would happen possibly sooner than even uh, Eunice with, with, the, uh, with, with, with his time schedule. And uh, I think that is a needed purpose, uh, though, in, though, though, uh, though in this city. I wouldn't be in, though in favor of an immediate assessment, obviously, but an assessment once the once they're developed, I think would 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 make per perfect sense. And so, in that sense, we would recoup uh, the, the majority, if not all, of our cost in that in that assessment process. And I really do believe that if this area it, it is developed, how this developer claims they're they're, they're going to do it. Especially because you have one person who said has, has what six lots on units. Six out of ten. It, it's going to be more attractive, to, though, though, to them to want to want to uh, build those up. So we have the possibility of recouping those costs uh, that way as well. The fines, which is the first time that I that I I I I I, I have thought about that. That's a great way to 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 uh, to do a project that we perhaps did 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 did, did, did not have on our long term radar. And um, especially, at, at though, at though as you mentioned, because um, the fines were are, are, are they're being uh, put on the, this individual or, or, the, or this property because of the eyesore to that area, so it's a repayment in essence. In my mind, if we're able to use uh, those all, 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 all those fines, whatever 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 they are, so. Um, the part about uh, flooding homes back there. I mean, I, I, I was raised um, out, 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 out on Wideview. That's only a few streets over. I've seen the flooding out there. I, 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 I would like to find out more about this check valve that was mentioned to put in there, regardless of, of, of what happens. 
and it is important. And I think we 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 learn learn we learn learn this when we had Debbie back in back in back in back back in 2012 that uh, there has to be um, uh, uh, exit points for people uh, on Bayshore. And from what I've heard tonight, there is that portion that even with the extension of, uh, of the West Bay Shore that could still get stuck if we had another major, ma major flood. So with, you know, Spruce Street still being able to go in, with being able to assess the, um, uh, the people on Eunice, should it ever get developed to, to re uh, recoup our cost uh, to being able to use uh, the fines to pay for a good chunk of, uh, of this road, and and uh, lastly with uh, having having the uh, the evacuation route in place, um, I would be in favor of this project um, t uh, to to go forward. And I think it just it just makes sense uh, to kind of have this all fit together and not develop this whole area and leave one road undone. And I think it does create incentive for the, for that developer, well, for that, for for those owners on on, on units that have the vacant lots to build and just complete that 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 that, that whole area. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, if I might, I know I, uh, we haven't heard from Vice Mayor and how he feels of uh, uh, Commissioner Steve. I just just for some understanding because. I, I did go out. I was asked to go out and look at those lots, and I, I went out there. But uh, it, it was we talking about Eunice? Which side of Eunice? It seemed like both sides are blocked. I mean, I tried to get through on one side, I couldn't, and I went to the other side, I couldn't get through. So I don't think we're talking about both sides. We're just talking about one side, right? May I say something, Mayor? Yeah. yeah okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, correct. So we're talking about the north side of Eunice Drive. And when I, when I asked you to go out and look at the south side of Eunice Drive, that was done so as an example to see the difference between putting the road through as a whole or putting the road through as each individual lot gets developed. And if you looked at the south side of Eunice Drive, you saw where there was stretches of asphalt from 20 years ago, stretches from five years ago, and, and individually piecemeal developed, which is you know, something that is not necessarily, in my opinion, to the standard of the city. So if you put the road through at once, which is what we're talking about, the north side to Bayshore Drive, you don't end up with a pothole street. Okay, because I, I, you know, when I went on one, I couldn't get through. When I went on another one, I couldn't get through. So, I, you know, it seemed like there's two of them that need, you know, if we're going to open it up. And I, so it was on one on the north, not the other one. The one on the south is a prime example of why I think it's important to put this road through. Okay, I'm just trying to piece together, you know, my little information I got. Going. If you're coming from the middle school, <clears throat> right, it would be the portion that's closed off to your left. You would take a left, and that portion that's closed off to the left. Right. And when I took a right, I couldn't go in no. of apartment buildings. I couldn't go through that one either. <laughs> Until somebody develops along there, that won't be okay. put through. All right. Just, just trying for some information now. We talk about assessment, so we're going to assess just the individuals that have the undeveloped property. Are we going to assess everybody on the street? I mean, I, that just, I would, well, it, just it, the vacant lots. Yeah, because we've develop. already got, the, if, you, if you see down there where the houses are, there is a partial road there. So where there's woods where it starts and there's no roads, uh, I would think those would be the property to be assessed. So we wouldn't do anything to upgrade the the street that we already have residents on. We would just say whatever they have there, they have, and we'll start from there and we'll, we'll upgrade, uh, put in a new street. So we wouldn't do anything to the present street in terms of trying to bring it up in terms of any standards or anything. Well, well we relative to tell them they could do that for free. Relative to your assessment question, uh, properties can be assessed that are going to receive uh, or derive a special benefit from the from the improvement or the service provided. So, you know, as I'm listening to the conversation, uh, there are potentially uh, properties that are, that receive benefit. I, you know, perhaps in the way of an additional evacuation route, or perhaps in the way of um, improved drainage um, and perhaps in some other ways that haven't been discussed yet but those properties can be assessed whether on units or not that uh, are going to receive a special 
uh, benefit from the uh, from the construction of the road or the attendant uh, so infrastructure. You're saying that we can we can actually assess the people on Bayshore because they'll be using units as their evacuation route. I think that would need, need some more staff analysis as to the benefit they might receive, but I think it's legally possible. And I just say that I'm not really, you know, it's been a long time since we looked at um, having any type of um, uh, access to to any resident as we build the roads, basically the developer has built them. But like I say, I'm just trying to understand what our thought process is now. And I see that it's changed a little. And I'm I'm not really sure that we need to rush units. And I just say it from this perspective. If we have to go out to bid, then what was really talked about as the main reason we should move right now is mobilization because the crew is already out there. So then there is a possibility of savings because the crew is out there. So if the crew is not out there, and we need to go out to bid, why do we need to rush it? And if we went out to bid, you know, which I have a real problem in terms of going out to bid and finding out exactly how much it would truly cost to do it, I don't think that it's good to be talking about assessing people for a road that didn't ask you for the road. You know, the developer, the people that own the lots are not asking for the road, but we talk about we will build a road and then we will make you pay for the road that you did not ask for. I thought that one thing that one of the, the gentlemen that came up and was talking about the people that's on units now is that if somebody want to develop and they want to build a road, then they'll build a road and then they'll have to pay the price anyway. So why should we move on making somebody do something that they don't want to do. And with all due respect to the individual who came up with the map and didn't want to go over to the podium, you know, my little time in Tarpon Springs say that when people really want something, they will definitely let you know, you know, that you don't have to worry about being speaking for 15 homeowners that truly want something they will pick up the phone and they will let everybody know. And if they're not comfortable talking to me, which most people are, there's everybody else is up here. And I'm not hearing from anybody out there that says that they want the road. That's what causes me the most concern about putting it in. But I'm saying, if we're not gonna use the developer that's out there now, what's the rush? If we have to go out to bid, then if you want to go out to bid, the bid comes in too high, then we don't do it. I mean, um, I did hear Mr. Lindyakis talk about spruce, and I know we have some figures down, but if I was reading between the lines, I kept hearing him say something about some consideration. I don't know what that means. I think that we should know exactly what that consideration is because one of the things that came out, and I asked Ms. Lemmers if she would kind of explain the uh, memo that she had in terms of how we can possibly recoup money, because we talked about once they build the homes there, then that was the property taxes and the rest of it, and how we get our money back. And it seemed like it was going to be a long time trying to get the money back that way. But when we look at what's going to happen on Spruce, we have some projected estimates, and, and it is some things in, that, in Ms. Walker's memo that I think is pertinent to our conversation. And the city manager knows because he went uh, uh, with me, I went with him, we went together to talk to DOT about not taking that light at Spruce because they were saying that light at Spruce was basically there because of Lowe's. Now Lowe's is not there, so they said that they was gonna take that light. Now, through some other political figures intervening in the rest, that that light was there. But now, <laughs> with Spruce opening and the rest of it, 
that's adequate justification for not removing the light. I thought that it would not be the best thing to remove a light that you've already put there. You've already expended the money and the rust of it, but their thought was, hey, we deal on signals and how many times people are using it and the rust of it. So um, it was touch and go for us removing that light from there. But spruce, and when we're talking about spruce and we're talking about any street, all of these figures are estimates. We all wish that they come in lower, but something happens when people have to go out to bid. They never seem to hardly come in lower. Most of the time they come in higher. So that's something that I'm concerned about as we look at units or, or spruce or any other street is how much it's actually going to cost us. Then we say that, you know, we want to be, you know, objective, you know, and we're looking at opportunities, not obligations, and what happens on mirrors. Well, one of the things that, that that's happens on mirrors, if they open up that street, if they talk about opening it up, well, for lack of a better word, trying to understand exactly the type of street they were talking about putting in there, but the street they would put in there would not have any sidewalks there. So you got a major road that would be um, an evacuation route without sidewalks. My thoughts is that if we have dollars to expend some type of way in roadway and the rest of it, why don't we look at what we can do on that road? Because we talk about walkability and then we say walk in the street. Let's go out to units. We have residents come here and say that they don't want it. We haven't had one person out that way that said that they want it, not one, that lives on there, you know, even though the one person comes, speak for everybody in that whole area out there, anybody in that area they speak for. But other than that person, there's been nobody to ask for the road. So my thought is, why are we talking about rushing this when there's no savings on uh, mobilization, we could go out to bid to find out exactly what we want to, if that's what we want to do. Nobody up here, I think, would want to uh, make somebody pay for that road that lives on Bayshore and to make the present owners who didn't ask us for the road pay for it, I don't think is fair. So I'm at a point of why are we trying to push this with all of the new information that's come forward to us. Why do we think that this is so important now that we can't take some time, wait, look at what's happening on Spruce because we have an opportunity. Maybe that's going to come in. It's going to cost a little bit more money. Um, Mr. Lindak is a, a nice man. I know that he just wants to just let the city utilize some of his property in terms of stormwater and rust of that. He don't want any type of compensation for it. He just want to do it because he's a nice guy. But business dictate that he probably need to have some type of trade-off. And more than likely, it's going to be a dollar trade-off. So I think that if we want to really be um, prudent as we move forward, we would try to see what's going to happen with that property. Since there's no rush now, I don't think it is. You know, unless somebody tell me you can divide out. We've already talked about this as, as one project. If we were to put all of the um, um, pipes and rust of that that we need to with that roadway now to save, we we'll say, no, we don't need to. We can do bid one and then use the developer. To me, that's how you end up getting sued because of somebody say that you're trying to circumvent the bidding process. You know, so that's my thoughts as we move forward. And I did go out there and I was trying to figure out why we wasn't talking about the other side of the street as we talk about the one side. Why didn't we talk about doing both of them? Because it's going to cost too much or, you know, I think that somebody on the other side of the street had wrote the city asking us <laughs> to pave it. And we didn't have the dollars to do that. And now we want to pave a side of the road that nobody's asking for. So those are my thoughts. I, and I wish that 
we all can agree. Um, but, you know, whether we all agree or not, I think that, you know, I would hope that we all are saying what we believe is in the best interest of the citizens of Tarpon. So. I don't know if you want to speak now, Vice Mayor, you want me to go to Commissioner C? No, I, I, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, I, I first uh, would like to ask the city attorney for a little bit of clarity. Um, it, you, you spoke a little bit earlier about this uh, in terms of reaching a uh, particular threshold and whether or not this would have to go to, out to bid. I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit further on that. Uh, yeah, generally public construction projects, public construction works that will exceed that $300,000 index threshold would uh, need to be put to a public uh, competitive bid process, a bidding process uh, that we've been discussing. Um, and so the question becomes whether what we have here is one project or two, because the statute that requires public competitive bidding also contains an explicit prohibition against dividing projects for purposes of evading the competitive so, bid process. So just if I understand, and you can provide some clarity on this, on, on one hand, the city could say, hey, let's do it all at one time because we've already got the mobilization out there and we, we can do it all at one time, but yet we would have to say, but, it, but it's separate projects in order to make sure we don't reach that threshold. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me also share that I don't have a lot of case law to go on relative to this statute, so I'm, I'm speculating on how a court may answer it. Um, I think the better argument based on what I've heard tonight is if you say, let's go ahead and do it all at one time, pr probably going to be construed as one project, and I would recommend strongly that it be put to the competitive bid process for the reason that the mayor mentioned. So, so it would have to go through, in, yeah. in your legal opinion, it should go through the competitive bid process. If the road and the infrastructure are done concurrently, yes. Okay. Um, another question I had, I guess this is for the city manager or, or perhaps the department head. Um, a, a comment was made, uh, and I wrote down and, and I put it in quotation marks, they, they have no way to get out. Um, the, the implication being that Eunice is needed uh, as an evacuation route. I, I wonder, Mr. LaCourse, or if you want to have somebody else address this, is, is Eunice required based, based on some kind of data as an evacuation route? Well, again, let me talk about what I've told some people out there, and then I've got Mr. Anderson there who's looked at it, and, and he can talk about what <clears throat> his attempts to do on both sides will be to alleviate that. Um, obviously, we're going to make attempts on both sides to keep that from happening and cutting those people off. But these last couple of years, I've seen incidents and storms and places flooded that, you know, I've been here my whole life and, uh, you know, I've seen places flood I never would have thought. Um, you know, one of the questions that was brought up to me is these things we're doing, and, and he can talk briefly about what he's doing on the one side so that people could get the West Bay Shore and then the new idea that's just developed to what to do to the other side. You know, I was asked at one of them, can you absolutely guarantee that those changes are going to keep that from flooding and blocking off? And I said, me personally, no, because I've seen too much of us putting stuff into effect in these 100-year events that's gone beyond that that's doing it. But if you would, Brian, just talk about what we're doing on both sides to, to uh, try to alleviate that. But again, I, as city manager, from what I've seen, couldn't guarantee that when we put all this in place on both sides, that there would not be a case with the tide and the storm that the possibility could be for a, and maybe he can tell you how many year event that it could still po possibly flood up. Certainly. Um, one of the uh, things that we're looking at uh, with the Bayshore project is, uh, which is on the, would be the north side. Um, well, there's two flooding areas. You have the, you have the Sunrise and Bayshore location where the boat ramp is. And then along north of that on Bayshore, you have a, a low area on, in the roadway that floods today. Um, and with the Bayshore project, they're going to be upsizing the pipe at that low point today to allow more water to convey through that. And they're going to slightly raise the road a little bit to prevent the road from flooding as well. In addition to that, they're going to be looking at adding one of these check valves to prevent high tide from entering the system and popping out in the inlets and causing roadway flooding. <laughs> Uh, their engineers have looked at it and they've determined that the roadway floods today for a 10-year event. Um, so what we've asked them to do, what the city's asked them to do is in their analysis and their engineering with Bayshore 
is to prevent flooding to occur at that location for the 25-year event. And uh, their engineers have been able to demonstrate that that is actually going to take place with their design. They're going through permitting of that now. So with the Bayshore project coming on, it would um, raise the protection of the roadway at that, at that location to prevent flooding up to the 25-year event. Uh, at the Bayshore and Spru uh, I'm sorry, Bayshore and uh, uh, sunset. Uh, sunset. Thank you. Sorry, uh, we are looking at that location now, um, and to and to looking at providing a check valve there, which would only prevent high tide from flooding the roadway. I mean, with the with the uh, with the uh, boat ramp that's located there. Uh, if we had a, a very large storm event, I mean, we're not going to build a wall across the boat ramp to prevent water from going across, you know, the guy's road. So, uh, putting in the putting in the valve there would prevent flooding from occurring only with high tide events. Um, it's not going to increase the capacity of the system. Uh, it would only prevent flooding that are that is uh, you know occurs with high tides. Thank you. Um, uh, a further question that I have, I, I guess, for the city manager. Um, a, a comment was made that the city will pay will, will pay for units one way or another. Um, and and the, the comment was, do we do it now or do we do it later? And I guess I just want to see clarification. If, if we choose to do nothing now in terms of units, if, I don't know, five years down the road, ten years down the road, um, if a if a developer comes in, I, I understand there's I don't know six to ten lots owned by one one particular owner. Six of the ten. Six of there. the ten. So if a if they choose to develop that, at that point in time, would the city be paying for the development of units, or would a developer be paying? The for developer it? would pay to put the road through to the. The, the developer would be the one to pay for that. The developer would be paying for it. Yes. So I, I guess one of the things we should look at as we discuss this this evening is whether or not we as the city of Tarpon Springs with tax payer, pa taxpayer money, should we be paying for units or should we allow that to be paid for by a developer at, at the time in which someone chooses to develop those lots? And I, I, I guess that's something to consider as well. Um, Th those are some of the things going through my head. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me that there are quite a few ifs as far as uh, the budgeting for, for units to be completed. Uh, doing the math, uh, if we do the Spruce Street project, which I think is, is pretty essential, uh, we'd still have to come with up, up with over $200,000, um, and that's just an estimate. Um, Eunice was not part of the original site plan. I know that we had two uh, public meetings uh, with Bayshore residents, and I don't know that there were any concerns with completing Eunice at the time and have not seen other residents from um, Bayshore here uh, wanting Eunice to be completed. Uh, I appreciate uh, the residents uh, from Eunice coming and, and speaking tonight. Um, I think that there are a lot of projects that are necessary in, in the city. I know when I was campaigning and I walked every neighborhood, the number one uh, concern was uh, infrastructure. And um, a lot of residents are concerned with streets being completed, the potholes and, and curbs and sidewalks. And um, I just feel that many residents would feel that there are other uh, things that we need to use money for that we uh, may have funding. Uh, for and if a developer can complete units in the future, uh, if those lots are, are, are finished, um, I would think that we should we could wait for that. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I'll just if I may. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, based on the comments that were that were said, which is fine. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, own opinion, and I can appreciate that. I think the first thing that's important to understand is that uh, being familiar with our city budget and our different enterprise funds and different funds that we have, you have to understand how different projects are paid for, okay? Sidewalks being one, streets being another, et cetera. Um, so it's not just one big pot of money that infrastructure is paid for out of, okay? That's the first thing that I would take into consideration. Um, second is 
because there's six lots, that doesn't mean that the developer is going to come in and build all six of those at once, okay? Um, by not putting in the road and the quote unquote developer who owns the six lots, him doing that piecemeal, you're gonna end up with exactly what we have across the street. Um, which is one person comes in, wants to buy a lot, they're responsible for 30 feet of roadway, it's substandard, there's no infrastructure or utilities underneath it, we don't collect as, many, as much impact fees, it's not a win-win. Um, the other thing that I'd like to, like to mention is that um, within the analysis that Ms. Lemons did, um, there is a financial gain to the city when a road is put in, lots are more desirable to somebody to build, the city collects over $10,000 worth of impact fees, okay? So let's just say there's 10 lots based on her analysis. If they're all developed, which they probably would because it's a desirable area, as we've seen with the Bayshore Heights development as a whole, um, that's $103,000 in impact fees collected, okay? Which can offset some of the expense that's put forth to build the road. Um, that said, there's an additional $9,000 based on a $200,000 home uh, assessment each year in ad valorem tax revenue that's collected to the, by the city. Um, so that's also a benefit by having a desirable lot in place for somebody to come build a home. Um, looking at other economic benefits, uh, you get more penny for Pinellas, you have more families living in town, more people living in town, it's centrally located to schools, parks, very desirable, those people spend money in town, they shop at the sponge docks, they shop downtown, et cetera. So anytime you can add more people um, to your demographic, to me, is a good thing. Um, but those are just some of my comments based on what I'd heard. Um, if we don't do it, I think it's uh, definitely a lost opportunity but uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, and uh, we can agree to disagree. Oh, I, I thank you for that. I'm not sure where we're at. I know you talked about a motion um, earlier, so you know we're at that point. But if you can just tell me this, is that how, how do you consider this a lost opportunity? I think it's a lost opportunity because we're at a point where there's hype for Bayshore Heights, or Bayshore, the Bayshore Heights development. Um, I think that there is, regardless of whether or not there's a mobility element with this Unis Drive going through with the Bayshore Heights development, um, there's an economies of scale to the development. Um, I think there's a better chance that by having this street put in, I think there's a better chance now for somebody to come in and grab those lots while they're doing the Bayshore Heights development. Um, that's the only reason why it wasn't discussed prior to is because there was no ownership uh, by Mercury Credit Corp or a willingness to sell by other owners on, along the Unis Drive. Um, if you think back to the lots that were contained within the Bayshore Height development, there were the Mercury Credit lots and there were also lots that were owned by individual owners that the people who put together the Bayshore Heights development were able to obtain contracts for. Um, so, I, and there's also the element that I, I truly believe that it is uh, an evacuation route for the people in between Sunset Drive and the hole where, where they're not putting the road through, where there's the stormwater uh, pipe going through, that those people are still gonna be, uh, you know, without a way to evacuate on a 10-year storm, which isn't even, I mean, that happens every 10 years or, or sooner. I mean, look at Debbie. Debbie was a 100-year flood and people could not get out. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, it's a little bit of a, of a lost opportunity for sure. Um, I, I just feel like you're gonna see exactly what we see on the south side of Eunice Drive, um, which is subpar. So, I mean, the money's there. Uh, I don't see why we wouldn't do it. And I was just asking, just sure. trying to get a better understanding about the lost opportunity because um, the same thing was said about the, the project that, that's being developed now. If the first time that project was denied, it was a lost opportunity, nobody else was gonna ever come in there, nobody else was gonna ever develop that property, and then what do we look at? Year or two weeks later, somebody else says, you know what, I've got a better project to put there. So I don't think that if we don't do it tonight, it's a lost opportunity, 
I think that if there's enterprising people out there that look and see what's already being developed, see that they, I've got six lots, I can do this, I can do that, the opportunity for them to pursue that is still there. Uh, we're not having any savings as far as the city's concerned because what we thought could happen for is development, that's developer out there doing it and saving some money is not actually possible. So it's like being back to square one. You know, we look at it, if somebody comes forward and do it, then they do it. If they don't, then they don't. But what I look at right now is that, you know, we're at a point of we've had discussion. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about anything else. But if there's a motion to move forward, if there's a motion not to move, or whatever you want to do, is now is the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll continue, uh, Mr. Mayor, with the motion uh, to um, ask staff to move forward with the uh, design phase, which also, regardless of whether we go out to bid now or later, you still have to have the design phase to do. So whether we build the road now or later or at all, in order to obtain a bid, we have to have a design phase. So that's my motion. Second. Uh, do you have a cost on what the cost is for the, uh, you know, we're talking about the, the design phase? It was in the area of $50,000, I believe. Um, $50,000. It's, it's between fifty and $60,000. We'll look at rolling the dice. Okay. Well, uh, you heard the motion, so if there's no other comments, uh, Mr. Seberg? No. Mr. <coughs> Banther? Yes. Mr. Terrapini? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? No. Mayor Archie? No. Um, I think that would mean that we don't need to move forward with 22P. So uh, that will conclude our agenda for this evening. <laughs> and then we go to <coughs> Captain Rising to the Chief. No comments, Mayor. Uh, the attorney. No comments. Mm -hmm. Madam Clerk. No comments. Mr. Bouther. No comments. Vice Mayor. No comments. Could we start panning? I would uh, just wish everybody uh, happy holidays. Um, tonight's the first night of Hanukkah. We have Christmas coming up, and it's a great time uh, to be in Tarpon Springs. And uh, just wish everybody happy holidays. Could we sleep? I also would like to wish everybody happy holidays and a happy new year. Um, first, I'd just uh, say on, your, on the dais, there's some information as it relates to Peace for Tarpon. Um, Gainesville had a chance to come in and talk to the Peace for Tarpon group and decided <laughs> that they would like to have Peace for Gainesville. So what's happening in Tarpon about being a trauma-informed community is starting to move across uh, Florida and across the nation. And I'd just like to thank, um, you know, Peace for Tarpon and for former uh, Vice Mayor Robin Sanger, who is the founder of that for their efforts uh, in moving it. Just to read one part of what was being said by others in that uh, health arena that Tarpon Springs is 10 years ahead of the curve in the field of community health by talking in terms of uh, being a trauma-informed community. And there's some information for you to uh, look at at your pleasure. Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, uh, in the new year, if we could uh, maybe have a discussion about the uh, tree ordinance. You know, I've had a resident talk in terms of having some health concerns and the rest of it. And I think that when the tree ordinance went in, uh, it was to try to deal with the developers and their uh, zeal in tearing, uh, cutting down trees. But there's also effect as far as the residents of Tarpon who are not going to be massively cutting down trees. It's having a financial mm -hmm. impact. And I just like when I told her that I would bring it to the commission and we'll put it on the agenda for as a discussion item to see if there's anything we think can be done. Another thing is sometime uh, f by the, the next New Year's that can we find out what's happening on Martin Luther King with the uh, lights there? I, if people tend to think that I'm personally responsible for those cones that's out there. <laughs> 
so we can see when we're going to put lights back up. Um, hopefully, that be yeah. hopefully they're going to be here, and it's real, it's real soon. Real, real soon. Yeah. Hopefully, in fact, by the next meeting, I'll be able to announce that the lights are in there. Uh, but I was hoping to announce at this meeting the light was lights were going to be in there. But uh, um, hopefully, they're on the way, and I'll be able to report at the first meeting of the next year that they're in and, and coming. So. Well, I'll check on that again. Um, again, I was hoping to be able to announce that before the end of the year, but let's see if I can try to start the new year with those lights being here and installed. And Okay. That, that sounds good to me. Um, with that, we'll adjourn our meeting at uh, 9.02.